All right, hey everyone, Nate here for True Crime Cast, and we have a very, very special interview today with Michael Benson, co-author of the book Moguls, talking all about some of the very darkest stories that Hollywood has to offer, kind of centering around the life of the Skank Brothers. Michael, hey, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Nate. Thanks for having me. All right, so for, first question. Now, on True Crime Cast, we don't really get to talk a lot about Hollywood, um, but w- what made you get into this Hollywood true crime focus, exactly? Well, my career in true crime was thrust upon me in June 1966. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's 666, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, while growing up in the rural town of Chi Lai, south of Rochester, New York, at nine years old, my babysitter, George Ann, and her friend, Kathy, from down the road, went swimming in a swimming hole behind my house and never returned. Chile, by the way, is where Brittany Drexel was from. Uh, it's a case you've covered. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, Kathy and Georgianne were found a month later, a few miles to the west of my house, off a lover's lane, murdered and sexually mutilated with a hunting knife. So real Jack the Ripper crime scene missing parts. So, anyway, my life changed in a horrible fashion. My country playground became a prison as kids were kept on a short leash. So I began writing about the murders when I was 12, fixated on the information I'd gotten from eavesdropping on adults that Georgianne had been found with her breasts removed. I remember writing in a tablet, disguising the work by putting it into the middle of whatever else I was writing about, usually baseball or men in space. And in college in the late 70s, I I used that journal to write a short story called uh, Killing Canaries. I think some of my My college friends might remember that. But jump ahead to June 2011. I went on Facebook, put up photos of Georgianne and Kathy and wrote, 45 years ago, we lost Georgianne and Kathy. If anyone knows anything, please get in touch. Now, the response was enormous. I teamed up with a private detective and the mom of one of the victims. And the investigation went in a startling new direction. And we brought the case to a satisfying conclusion, which resulted in my 2015 book, The Devil at Genesee Junction. Now, you back up. Close to 30 years, my very first book was called Vintage Science Fiction Films. And I have been um, you know, fascinated with old time Hollywood for, for many years. And I teamed up with film director Craig Singer recently to write about the two of the, the biggest uh, moguls in Hollywood history who nobody has ever heard of for a, for a couple of reasons. So the book's called Moguls. And it's the first full bio of the most powerful brothers in Hollywood history. Three times more powerful than the Warner Brothers. There are Nicholas and Joseph Skank, who at one point controlled 20th Century Fox, United Artists, and Nick, as boss of Lowe's Inc., controlled MGM and the Lowe's theater chain. And until the release of this book, the Skank brothers were almost completely unknown. They'd been forgotten. And a couple of reasons. Uh... After talkies came in, neither one of them ever put their name on any logos or in the credits. Uh, Skank is not a musical name. I mean, it could have been Metro Goldwyn Skank, could have been Skank Inc., it could have been 20th Century Skank, uh, Metro Goldwyn Skank. Um, but it wasn't. Um, it would be interesting to know how many of the Warner Brothers would be remembered today if they hadn't named the company after themselves. Exactly. <laughs> now, the other reason the Skanks uh, almost disappeared into the mists of time was that Nick had a loving wife and beautiful daughters and wanted to keep his work and home separate because, and I just realized this the other day, Hollywood, the Hollywood colony was the first social experiment in global history in which everybody was really good looking. <laughs> and predictably sexual excesses resulted and from that violence it drew organized crime and more violence so you know, it, it really was kind of a sordid situation back in the old days and uh this is the story about the weird things that happened and how the moguls worked to confuse the public as to what actually had occurred now, when you think of moguls nowadays, or when I think of them, at least, I kind of got a hard time imagining the day-to-day of what a mogul is going to look like in 2024 when we're recording this interview. With the decentralization of Hollywood, right? it's almost like a, a microcosm of America. Everything's becoming in your pocket, right, on your phone, and not so much you know, in a studio in California. Yes, I, and I think the first one, certainly the first one we deal with in the book, 
uh, and the reason why the fixer system was put in place was the unfortunate uh, death of Virginia Rappe, R-A-P-P-E. I always thought it was a very unfortunate last name for the poor woman because um, it looks like rape. Mm -hmm. uh, and on September 5th, 1921, there was a party going on in a suite at the St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco, uh, occupied by Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, who at the time was one of the biggest movie stars in the world, uh, no pun intended. He was a uh, what they would call a fat comedian. His humor did not come from, he, from him being too huge to do things. It came from him being agile despite his size. Uh, reminiscent maybe of a later Jackie Gleason. Mm -hmm. um, and he's he's in this suite with uh, actor Lowell Sherman, director Fred Fishback, and a revolving series of starlets who are coming and going. Uh, they're at the time of the incident, there are five men and four women in the suite. Uh, one, one guest was 30-year-old model of Virginia Rappe, who'd spent the previous decade being a promising starlet. But her expiration date on Promising Starlet was perhaps already passed. She was best known up until this evening as the cover girl on the sheet music for the song, Let Me Call You Sweetheart. Now at the party, Rappé falls ill and a doctor is called. As our Arbuckle later said, uh, I'll go to the, the glasses here. We carried her into another room and put her to bed. The doctor and all of us thought it was no more serious than a case of indigestion. And he said a little bicarbonate of soda would probably relieve her. Uh, the next day, Arbuckle returns to LA and Rappe is taken to a private sanitarium. On September 9th, Arbuckle learns that Rappe has died. He's summoned back to San Francisco by city authorities. Uh, Joe Skank and Sid Grauman of Grauman's Chinese Theater uh, go with him because uh, Joe and Sid are the two guys who are making the most money off of Fatty Arbuckle. Now, upon turning himself in at the Hall of Justice, Arbuckle's arrested, measured, he weighed 266 pounds. He's handcuffed and put in a cell. He doesn't know what it's all about, at least he claims that. Turns out that Rappé had died from peritonitis caused by a punctured bladder. And witnesses were saying things that led police to believe Arbuckle was responsible for the fatal injury. I think the famous comment at the time was, bladders don't puncture themselves. Um, now, the police now have witnesses who are saying that Arbuckle said to Rappé, I've been trying to get at you for five years, as he pulled her into the bedroom and locked the door. Uh, the reports were that she was screaming in there, uh, that led party guests to pound on the bedroom door and attempt to break it down. And when Arbuckle at last opened the door, Rappé was unconscious on the bed, and when she woke, she blamed Arbuckle for her injuries, and the story made newspaper headlines for months. And in the uh, William Randolph Hearst papers, the story would always be accompanied by an uncaptioned photo of a long-necked beer bottle. You know, apparently the weapon that Fatty was supposed to have used to puncture the poor woman's bladder. Uh, so the press contacted doctors, gave their opinions, uh, Hearst himself later said that Fatty Arbuckle sold more newspapers than the sinking of the Lusitania. And reporters were told that the party suite had been thoroughly trashed. One bed was broken down to the floor, mattress half off, and separated from its headboard. Now, the fatal effect on Arbuckle's career is instantaneous. Um, Joe Skank, his boss, agrees to pay for his legal fees. And it, it's it's historically written in many places that, that this was a gift from Joe to Roscoe Arbuckle, when in reality, when it was all over and Roscoe couldn't pay him back, Joe took his house. So he lent the, he lent him the money to pay for his, uh, his defense. Now, at the inquest to the death, uh, Rappe's good friend Maude Delmont testified that she became concerned when she realized that Virginia and Arbuckle had gone into the bedroom and that the door was locked. She pounded on the door but got no response. She went out and fetched a hotel manager who unlocked the door, and inside they found Ar Arbuckle wearing Virginia's hat at an inebriated angle, and uh, apparently nothing else. Um, Virginia was writhing in pain, her clothes shredded on the floor, and she was saying, he hurt me, he did it, I know I'm dying, he hurt me. 
Uh, now, it, it later comes out that these witnesses uh, have been known to extort rich men uh, for sexual indiscretion. So there's casting a doubt on just how honest they were. Uh, the autopsy does nothing to help Arbuckle's case. Horner finds bruises on the victim's upper arms and on her legs. Uh, the bladder rupture has been caused by external violence. So Joe goes to uh, goes to the funeral. There's 8,000 people there. And the murmur in the crowd is that this is typical Hollywood. Hollywood is a cesspool, and this is typical. Now, in Arbuckle's first trial, the defense predictably went after the victim's reputation. She had a punctured bladder because she was a floozy. Um, and that trial results in a hung jury. Arbuckle's convicted briefly at the second trial, but the judge overturns the conviction because a poll of the jury reveals the verdict had not been unanimous, but by nine to three vote. At the third trial, the jury deliberated for less than 10 minutes before acquitting him. And very unlike a jury, they, they included a public statement that said, acquittal is not enough for Roscoe Arbuckle. We feel that a great injustice has been done to him. We also feel it was only our plain duty to give him this exoneration. Uh, it sounds like money might have exchanged hands there. That's really unjury like uh, The statement had no effect on, uh, on the public opinion of Fatty Arbuckle. You know, he thought that once he was acquitted, his career would start up again. But uh, the problem wasn't that he was guilty of murder. It was that he had been rendered a funny man forever unfunny. The Fatty Arbuckle story is just... <sighs> It's sad and it's it's uh, confusing and it's uh, quite tragic. And regardless of what the truth is, um, nothing good happened out of this. And now, now, Fatty did get a little bit of an upswing, though, correct, at the end of his career. Is that, is that true, what I read? Yeah, he got a few gigs writing. Uh, he, he had a stage act in which he cavorted around with scantily clad women. It seemed like really tone deaf to the, to the predicament he was in. And he eventually, you know, drank himself to death. Mm -hmm. But the, I think what happened after that 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 murder was that the moguls realized that, that they have to get to crime scenes before the police do. Uh, and if something untoward happens like that, uh, that the situation should be confused so that their stars aren't getting wiped out by their own indiscretions. And in comes Eddie Mannix. Who is the Skank Brothers henchman? They they ever since he was a juvenile delinquent trying to steal stuff at Palisades Park, which was run by the Skank Brothers, and they didn't have him arrested, but they hired him instead. So now you steal for us, not from us. Um, he he is assigned to be the fixer, and when there are problems, and not all, not just murders, but uh, sex scandals, uh, gay people who need to need beards, that kind of thing, Mannix was in charge of uh, keeping the gossip columnists and the truth as far apart as possible. Um, now he, Maddox was faithful and he, was, and he was good at fixing scandals, but he was also completely amoral. And I guess another murder we discussed in Moguls is the, is the death of his first wife. Uh, Maddox was known to be violent with women. He broke his first wife, Bernice's neck. A mistress uh, named Mary Nolan had to have several surgeries after he beat her up. And in November 1937, near Palm Springs, Eddie's wife, Bernice, dies in a car crash. At the scene, cops found a second set of tire tracks uh, indicating her car had been violently sideswiped, but there was no follow-up investigation. Uh, this despite the fact that a survivor of the crash, nightclub owner Al Wertheimer, alleged that a tow truck and another car blocked the highway to cause Bernice's car to overturn. And Bernice's death freed up Mannix to spend more time with his Ziegfeld girl, uh, Tony Lanier, the so-called girl with the million dollar legs. Uh, Tony would become the second Mrs. Mannix, but only after wasting her best years as his sideline gal. And of course would be very, very involved in a one of Hollywood's most mysterious murders in the 1950s. Yeah, one of my favorite movies is uh, L.A. Confidential, which is Where? all about the inner workings of Hollywood and the journalists and the police and the fixtures all working together. Now, now, did Mannix ever work with journalists or what, what was his relationship like with the media, would you say? Well, I think that media was afraid of Eddie Mannix. 
works. Mm. Uh, you, you you didn't want to print something he didn't want you to print. Uh, he was, you know, he's a blackmailer and extortionist by at birth. Um, and as far as I can tell, the only people he was ever loyal to were Joe and Nick Skank. Um, he would he would betray anybody over anything uh, if he thought that there was a a, a thumbs up for him. Uh, and he was sent. Nick Skank decided to stay on Long Island because he wanted to keep his wife and his kids away from the cesspool of Hollywood. But he sent Eddie Mannix to MGM and made him a top executive. And Eddie Mannix's job was not just to to make sure that the press didn't didn't print anything that that uh, that Nick didn't want them to, but also to spy on Louis B. Mayer, because Louis B. Mayer spends a lot of time thinking he's in charge of MGM. And I think the world believes that Louis B. Mayer is in charge of MGM, but Nick is his boss. And if Mayer tries to do something behind Nick's back, well, there's Eddie Maddox on the other side of the room, already on the phone. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw the movie Hell Caesar. Hell Caesar has a lot of scenes where Eddie Maddox is Mr. Skank. <laughs> I got news for you, Mr. Skank. That's a George Clooney, right? Is that a couple of Yeah, it is George yeah, Clooney. Yes. I, I think I have seen that. Yeah, it's been a while. Or I think they're held. Yeah, take off on MGM, uh, not at its best years. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard stories of like Orson Welles getting bugged, uh, like his studio phone was bugged, and uh, they had complete control basically over every bit of communication. Uh, oh, Eddie, Eddie Mannix who? read every telegram that went exactly. out and came into MGM. Well, Mannix was surrounded by a lot of celebrities, and obviously his wife would be too in that situation. And she sparked up a relationship or two on the side. Is that correct? Well, Tony? Yeah, exactly. Tony, well, yeah, uh, Tony Mannix is important to uh, another murder discussed in, in Moguls. Um, she was the daughter of a French immigrant who decorated department store windows in Rochester, New York, my hometown. She changed her name to Tony Lanier. She became a Ziegfeld girl, said she was the girl with the million dollar legs. Um, after she became a middle-aged woman and married, married Eddie Mannix, she started an affair with TV Superman George Reeves. Uh, and now Eddie Mannix was a serial cheater. Uh, he had many girlfriends. So, and, and, he, and he apparently didn't go nuts when he found out Tony had a boyfriend it, it, it was an arrangement there i know that tony and eddie would sit at the front of the plane and george reeves and the the maid who was uh eddie's girlfriend would sit together in the back of the plane so that they knew what was going on uh in 1959 reeves is one of tv's biggest stars star of the adventures of superman yeah. and the world is just completely shocked when reeves dies at age 45 in his benedict canyon home from a theoretically self-administered gunshot wound. A common belief was that Reeves, who'd had a small part in Gone with the Wind 20 years earlier, had grown despondent over his typecasting as the superhero. But over the years, what really happened to Reeves has remained a mystery. So it shouldn't come as any surprise that Eddie Mannix was at the very least tangentially involved. Uh, Reeves had recently ended his long affair with Tony Mannix, broke it off, which is complicated because he's living in a house that Tony gave him, which was purchased with Eddie's money. So now George is in there with his new girlfriend in the house Eddie bought for Tony and her boy toy. Uh, now, by the mid-1950s, as Tony's having her affair with Reeves, Mannix had seen his day as a ladies' man. His last girlfriend was the maid. Um, he ha had already had 10 heart attacks. He would survive 10 of his 11 heart attacks, as, as I put in the book. More than um, most. That's, that's, that's right. It's above the national average. Um, things took a dark turn after Reeves became bored with Mannix, took up with another woman, a 38-year-old woman, Leonore Lemon, uh, who he met on a business trip in 1958, broke it off with Tony, um, now, Tony called Reeves hundreds of times after he broke up with her. Hundreds of times till he stopped answering the phone. His dog was stolen and was never returned. He was in a car accident because somebody had drained his brake fluid. Then, during the early a.m. warnings of June 16, 1959, he's found in his bedroom nude and dead 
a Luger on the floor. And the case is treated by authorities as a simple case of suicide. Now, truth is, Reeves hadn't done anything to upset Eddie, uh, but he had upset Tony. And Tony was married to a man who knew how to get things done in Hollywood. Police found two unexplained bullet holes in Reeves' bedroom, both covered up by a rug. But the LAPD, as always in the industry's pocket, especially Eddie's, refused to investigate. Reeves' mother tried to hire people to investigate, but they refused, saying there were too many dangerous people involved. Some just assumed that Eddie was behind the hit, including his co-fixer, Howard Strickling, who told writer Samuel Marks, Eddie did do it, of course. How many more times did this happen and we didn't know about it or we didn't have the coverage? I mean, the fact that you know, George Reeves was the one who died, and not even Superman was safe in this instance. It's just kind of crazy. Producer William, that's right. That's yeah. right. The bullet did not bounce off his chest. It did not. Oh, uh, yeah. Producer William Mintz uh, dies on William Randolph Hearst's yacht. Uh, Thelma Todd found in a, in a garage, uh, beat up but dead of suicide uh, from carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, there's nothing on the bottoms of her shoes, which there would have been had she gotten in the car without being carried. Um, William Desmond Taylor, dead in a bungalow, uh, probably shot by a, the stage mom of the little girl he was directing. Uh, and uh, even years later, Marilyn Monroe, yeah. uh, probably killed, made to look like a suicide. The witness who apparently saw way too much, too frightened to say anything to anybody. I, I know what happened, but I can't say because I want my family to stay safe. And, it, and it's, that's just the way it is. You know, it's Chinatown, Jake. So if we take a look at Hollywood through the golden age and up to today, I, I'd like to think that Hollywood isn't as powerful as it used to be, where they could just cover up murders en masse and they could assault women. And I mean, there's just a, a huge power shift that's taken place. Can you give me an idea and the listeners, when did that happen, that power shift, if at all? I think it started to break up with television. Okay. Um, television came in. Uh, the studios reacted to it uh, in different ways. Some embraced it and immediately provided programming for the, the new monster in people's living rooms. Uh, others, including the Skank brothers, who were older men at this point, uh, kind of didn't see that the shift was coming. I mean, Nick should have known. Nick paid millions and millions of dollars to build a theater in 1929. And from 1929 to 1950, the amount of money that was being put into building new theaters went down every year. So, I mean, movie theaters were going to have to reinvent themselves. They'd have to go through a porno phase. They would have to, anyway, like three, three D was attempted, but it was falling apart. Uh, so the power there lessened and showbiz became more diversified. I mean, there really was a time when you could fit the men who ran Hollywood around one table and they'd all known each other since the vaudeville days when they ran theaters in New York City. I mean, these were the same guys. They sort of invented show business as we know it. Uh, and those guys were getting old and dying off and being replaced by a new breed uh, that didn't see keeping all of the actors and the cast and crew in one small space for a nine to five job was not the best way to create art. Um, and and it, it's never going to go back to being a studio system again. I mean, maybe it's a good thing that it's all become decentralized because, uh, I mean, the studios have done great things, but they've done some pretty awful things too. Nick Skank, the hero of our book, never wanted to get closer than 3,000 miles yeah. to the operation he ran mm -hmm. because he knew. Yeah. I mean, then in the book, there are other discussions that aren't murder scandals. Uh, poor sales girls or, or poor showgirls were invited to a salesman's party. They were told it was an audition. And when they got there, they just realized they were the entertainment for these drunken salesmen. And eventually, you know, some 17 year old girl gets raped and she's referred to by the studio as, you know, girl 216, because that's how she was listed on the casting sheet. Uh, it's just, you know, woo. Yeah. Um, 
and you had a, a, a case where there was a plethora of good looking, but not necessarily bright people coming into town every year. And 95% of them, maybe probably more, are crashing and burning in some horrible way. And they do anything, you know, to to be a star. And they're, and they're desperate. That's right. And and that's a, a tale of all this time, right? As far as all as Hollywood, you know, people <laughs> from the Midwest, you know, these big sky, you know, big star dreams and things like that. And just, Joe, Joe Skank once said that, you know, attracting girls in Hollywood is you know, like attracting deer to a salt lick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and with that, the amount of powerful men that would be preying upon them. I mean, I, right. And, and again, they, they weren't all evil. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think one thing we learned about Joe Skank is that he'd used the casting couch, but he was nice. He, if, if they said no, they got the cheap $50 a week contract anyway. And he would, you know, say, okay, but if anybody else hits on you, let me know, because if you're turning me down, I want you to turn everybody down. Sure, because I'm the because I'm the nicest one out there. Marilyn it's, Monroe it's became a his friend. Morality out there, I suppose. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe became his mentor and then his friend, and uh, I'm I'm certain that they had lots of sex together, but uh, it, it went way beyond that. They liked each other, you know. And I think with the Harvey Weinstein trials and stuff, casting couch gets a bad name, and rightfully so. But it, it's not always exclusively uh, malevolent. Hmm, interesting. That's that's a, a take that you are not going to hear probably very often. I feel like immediately when right. when I hear casting couch, I think Harvey Weinstein. I think you know women being cornered by like Matt Lauer or someone like that. And, right, right. Yeah, you you put out or you're fired. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm sure that and that certainly did happen in Hollywood. I know Harry mm -hmm. Cohn did that to Marilyn Monroe, mm -hmm. and that's the reason that's the reason we know that Joe was nice is because Marilyn went home to her roommate who was Shelley Winters. And said, you know, Harry Cohn's a pig. I had to get off his yacht or else he was going to do horrible things to me. You know, Uncle Joe, he's a nice man. I'm going to go over for dinner tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, it's two different guys, you know, both using their power to attract beautiful young women. All right, I'm going to get you out on this one. And, and I did not preface this before our, our chat, so uh, forgive me. But I got to ask, uh, your blurb. Terrence Winter, who wrote both The Sopranos and wrote Boardwalk Empire, two of my very favorite shows ever, not just in the crime and, you know, mob world. No, I'm talking ever. Those are two of my favorite shows. And he spoke very highly of this book, calling it a, you know, a, a fun roller coaster. Can you talk about Terrence and how you got that blurb? Like, what, what what's all that about? My co-author is Craig Singer. Movie director Craig Singer, by the way, is my co-author. Yeah. Um, he's, he's just not the murder guy. Sure. He is the show business guy. And he and Terrence had a discussion, I guess, years ago um, about why nobody had ever written about the skanks. And it, 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 the people who knew them still remembered them and were hip enough to Hollywood history to, to know what they were, uh, were kind of astounded. Nobody came up with this idea before. So when we finally got the, the book deal 12 years later, uh, after trying to make it into a movie, a miniseries, we, 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 it, it went it went around a few times before it became a book. Um, we went back to, to to Terrence and asked him to write the forward. And boy, did he ever! I mean, it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, he, he says, you know, he says the Skank brothers were even more powerful than the Marx brothers. I mean, he's incredible, and obviously he spoke highly of the book, and I'm going to speak highly of the book because it's awesome, and everyone who's listening should go check out this book. It's Moguls by Craig Singer and Michael Benson. And, Michael, where can we find that book? Where would you suggest uh, you know we go when we look for that book? Yeah, bookstore near you. I mean, we prefer you get it from your local bookstore if you possibly can. Uh, if you can't, go to the, the chain stores, and if, if they don't have it, you can always get it online in Amazon or, or BN.com. And a lot of uh, local bookstores too can order it. Absolutely, it. I think that that would be the best way to go if you can, if you can wait a couple of days, yeah. have your bookstore ordered if they don't have it. And once they've read the book and they want to tell you how much they loved it, where, where's a good place that they can find you on, like social media or whatnot? Uh, at author Michael Benson, all one word. If you put that into your 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 search box there, uh, you'll come up with uh, pages of stuff on me. All right. Well, Michael, thank you so much for hopping onto this interview, a special true crime cast interview with Michael Benson, co-author 
of moguls. Yeah, Michael, we got to get you back on this show, man. I really enjoyed this uh, conversation, and I'm sure we're going to have some great ones again here down the road as well. Thanks for your time. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to this episode of True Crime Cast. I'm Nate, your host, uh, at least for today. Of course, John and Jamie are your main dogs. They'll be back with some great new content here this week, so make sure that you stay tuned. Leave that five-star review for John and Jamie, and we're going to have plenty more of these cool interviews for you to listen to and learn more about some of these untold stories. Plenty of content coming out in the True Crime Cast world, of course, produced by Stoveleg Media, igniting conversation.